It's great that we all have the opportunity to travel again after the COVID time. Unfortunately, railway stations and especially airports have many challenges due to understaffing in among other security screening areas. Would there be even more queues if also a product passport was needed? In today's interview I will discuss the digital product passport and other suggestions from the Sustainable Product Initiative with Erika Koen from Clariant and Kevin Pollard from ECA. Welcome. Kevin, the ECO design for sustainable products regulation, the ESPR, will be the cornerstone of EU circular economy action plan. Can you explain what it aims to achieve? Yeah, there's, there's multiple objectives there, Cheert, and indeed the, the cornerstone of, of the action plan. Um, so the ESPR is, is targeting um, basically an acceleration towards more circular economy, uh, more efficient use of resources, uh, working within so-called planetary boundaries, um, and you'll hear more about this uh, in, in the, the conference session from, from the Commission, from Christina. Some of the main highlights, uh, the concept of digital product passports to give uh, transparency on substances of concern both to waste operators and consumers. There will be a series of standards and requirements in terms of reusability, repair repairability, and there's also the possibility to set um, sustainability restrictions uh, which I would see as complementing what REACH and COP do in, in terms of addressing chemical, chemical risk. So those are some of the highlights. I don't know if Erica maybe wants to add. Yes, uh, indeed. I, I think uh, it was presented as making sustainable products the norm. And, and this describes very well the overall aim to create more transparency and more knowledge on sustainable products to track and trace what is really in, to create more understanding along the value chain. Um, and this is uh, what we, as a chemical industry, really welcome very warmly. Good, and uh, thanks for that, Erica, because that made, made me wish to add. Um, this is going to be a relatively long journey. This is planning until 2050. Uh, there are already a number of front runners in the circular economy, and as Erica said, it's to normalize and have the mainstream so the idea is not only products would be more safe, more sustainable, but we would have in, in, encouraged an innovation, investment, new technologies, new processes uh, that can also put us on a, on a stronger footing on the global economic stage. So it's, it's both about safety, sustainability, pl planetary boundaries, but also equally important e economic sustainability and advantage. Yeah. Wonderful aims. Hey, I understand that extending the scope of the Eco Design Directive should aim at helping create a stimulus in the demand for secondary materials and a market for sustainable products in general to achieve a successful transition and to position the European Union market as a leader in sustainable products. How will workable interfaces between legislations like REACH, COP, ROSE, the Waste Directive be ensured? Yeah, maybe I could start. Um from, from the ECHA perspective, where of course we follow most closely on, on the chemical safety, chemical risk dimensions. So as I see it, we have the REACH, the COP, um, Waste Framework Directive, the uh, OSH legislation and the various sectorial legislations, textiles, construction products, and they are being fine-tuned, revamped, let's say, to guarantee chemical safety, freedom from um, risk towards consumers, citizens, the environment and so on. So REACH and COP will be addressing, um, will have a strong focus on SVHC, substances of very high concern, sometimes called the most harmful chemicals in the chemical strategy, and then the wider arena of, substance, of, of substances of concern, which are defined there in, in the chemical strategy, will also be part of ECHA's focus to see which of those may need to be regulated. Those that do not need to be regulated for immediate uh, reasons for me, that's how I see the ESPR and also the Safe and Sustainable by Design Initiative that can foster transition away from those, from those substances of concern. So as I see it, on the one side, guaranteeing chemical safety with the existing legislations and then upgrading the eco-design to bring the, the kind of features that we discussed at the beginning. The ESPR being at the core of this um, initiative now should really uh, define clearly at the interface what is uh, really um, sustainability, the, the, the difference between the, uh, the restrictions due to sustainability requirements, the restrictions due to safety requirements, which we see also with REACH and the union uh, uh, regulation, especially uh, when it comes to the management of the substances of concern. Um, there should be a very clear definition in the ESPR because so far we have seen the 
a mentioning of substances of concern in the chemical strategy for sustainability. Now we have the first um, definition of substances of concern in the ESPR. And, and finally, it will be really how to manage this, how to go for restriction. We will have to have a clear process and, and, and um, how to restrict substances for other reasons than for safety. So, um, meaning then for sustainability reasons, all this has uh, to be still clarified in, in the coming, coming processes. Okay, thank you. Kevin, will there be duplication of existing chemical regulations for substances? And if so, can that be avoided? I don't really see any duplication. Uh, as I mentioned before, I really see this as a suite of complementary poly me policy measures and instruments. Um, now, of course, it's still uh, essentially a work in process. The legislation is still um, still moving through the process. There are still some things that need to be clarified. Uh, Erica was pointing out a few. Um, but I don't really see any duplication or redundancy here. I see, I see a very cleverly designed suite of instruments. Yeah. I think it would be really helpful then to have this clarity, as you were saying, in the description, in the text of the ESPR because it is inherently there, but not uh, very precise. The digital product passport plays a crucial role. What is needed to make this passport a success? Good question. I think the first and the most important point is it has to be user-friendly. It, it has to be accepted by all actors in the supply chain. And it has to cover also all actors to make sure that we have really the full tra transparency on our products. Then it has to focus on those substances and those products that really matter. And in addition, it has to respect uh, uh, the intellectual property and CBI. Okay. So it should be really um, yeah, focusing on, uh, on, the, on, the, on bringing the information that really needs to be there, uh, on the need to know principle. Okay, Kevin, anything yeah, to add? I think Erica makes some good points, maybe a few uh, additions from my side. So again, the starting point here, these digital product passports, they're intended to transmit information on uh, chemical hazards, substances of concern, uh, and various sustainability um, information, uh, so-called env environmental footprint. Uh, and the ESPR is already, in my view, very clear uh, in terms of the, the role, the function, the type of information of, of the digital product passport. What's, what's not yet so clear, and we're, we're following with great interest, is what would be the overall architecture for this? Um, not only the IT infrastructure in terms of formats, but also how different elements of existing instruments would fit, fit together. So would the SDS be a source system for some of this information? Companies' own systems? Uh, and I do know, for example, that the SCIP database itself, um, ECHA's database of substances of very high concern in products, is also under consideration as a potential source system. So from my side, on top of what Erica was saying, um, we'll be looking forward to getting clarity in how it all fits together systematically. Yeah. Hey, I learned that the Commission considers integrating a product environmental footprint, PEF. Uh, as a methodology in its policy frameworks to guide the assessment of the sustainability performance of products. So indeed, the PEF is mentioned as one, one of the approaches for the screening of the uh, environmental footprint uh, criteria. So far, we see a kind of, of, of limitation in the PEF approach because uh, the circularity feedstock, for instance, is not reflected in other additional um, criteria that might be really relevant in a circularity approach and uh, therefore we, uh, we think that it might be good to have a, a flexibility in addressing these points by using other scientifically based approaches like uh, for instance the ISO 14040. The transition to uh, safe and sustainable by design and the sustainable product initiative uh, needs concrete incentives and public funding. Uh, beyond green public uh, procurement, what are the concrete incentives, Kevin, the Commission could deploy? Yeah, that's um, not something I'm following quite so closely, but we do know, for example, I mentioned it before, the safe and sustainable by design uh, framework, which is essentially uh, being designed uh, to be used in a research and innovation context, both at the European and at the national level. Uh, we also have the sustainable financing, but I must admit I, I don't know in great detail 
what these instruments are and probably also during the session the Commission uh, will will expand on that a bit further. Uh, Erica, maybe you have some suggestions on uh, incentives the Commission should uh, deploy? First of all, I think we should not forget that uh, this overall approach that we are we really welcome is a huge effort. It is really a huge effort and and it has to be incentivized to really make sure that it is a success. Meaning supporting innovation, supporting supply chain communication, also um, enhancing uh, networks between the different actors in this overall arena, let me call it like this, um, and also um, making sure that we have fair prices, we have the, then the visibility really to, to really create more appetite towards sustainable products. An appetite is important. Ensuring a level playing field across the EU and non-EU companies needs adequate enforcement to ensure competitiveness and innovation. It will be crucial that the data collected under the ESPR can be checked in the products. Um, this will need considerable efforts to improve the analytics of these products. What are your thoughts uh, on implementing this and also securing a level playing field with regards to imports? Yeah, I think um, we are not yet there really to have the full analytics. So we have to make sure that before entry into force of the ESPR, we have analytical methods, we have a clear description, we have a, a clear governance on how to deal with this topic. Because at the end, we want to make sure that we secure this high level of sustainable products as we want to have them in Europe and we do not bring them in with our imports. In addition, we have to, to ensure, you, you mentioned the level playing field, with what we have to communicate. Because if we import products, having SOCs in, this is clear, then we, we will get this information, most probably. If um, SOCs were just used during manufacturing, like for instance, catalysts, they will not be in the product anymore. There will be by no means, by no analytics, the opportunity really to, to double check. So here it is really the point to make sure that we do not create a kind of imbalance between, between the European products and the imported ones. I, I would only add that of course it's, it's, it's absolutely essential that the import issue uh, be addressed. It's uh, going to be a sizable chunk of, of what's on the European market and as Erica points out a number of issues that would need to be resolved and I know this un is, is under considerable focus from the Commission both in terms of what's possible with customs and enforcement but I don't follow so closely on that so can't say more. While talking on products, uh, Kevin, while you're here, it's great. Um, it would be great if you could give us an update on the SKIP database. Uh, yeah, I'd be very happy to. Um, so the SKIP database uh, we've had quite a massive response from industry, um, around 20 million submissions since we uh, entered into operation with the database. Um, had some technical challenges going live with the dissemination, quite a turbulent time, but we went uh, in autumn last year live with the dissemination. Uh, we continue to receive a lot of files, a lot of updates. So in that sense, a very um, uh, very prominent response from the companies that have, have complied and they are to be congratulated for that. If I move to the quality of the data, keeping in mind that the main purpose of this database is to feed waste operators with information on uh, SVHC, what type of article or component they're in, where, where they are located and any safe use advice for dismantling or safe recovery. Uh, and there we have a, more, a much more mixed picture. If I start with the positives, we do see a number of files that have been uh, submitted in line with our adv advice. If it's a complex assembly like a car or a bicycle or an engine component, uh, companies have taken care to give a clear dossier hierarchy starting with the main block and then allowing you to drill down, see where the SVHC is located, even telling the function and so on, concentration range. Uh, so that's superb. Unfortunately, we see a, a, a vast number of submissions which uh, have not been submitted in, in accordance with the ECA advice and guidance. No, no dossier hierarchy, no clue where the SVHC is located, often even no clue what type of article it is. 
uh, internal um, internal uh, trade names from internal names from from SAP. Uh, so uh, a very mixed bag in terms of dossier quality and um, something which which uh, ideally uh, would improve. And how many have been submitted so far? It's it's around 20 million not, uh, sub submissions that we've had until now. Of course, that's not representative of the number of unique articles because we have uh, many different actors uh, submitting. Uh, from different elements, different parts of the supply chain, different member states and so on. But still a substantial but number. But quite some files, yeah. yeah. And even more, if you extrapolate now, we are talking now about SVHCs. I think we are in the 230 uh, number yeah. of uh, SVHCs. Roughly. Yeah. The estimate of substances of concern is between 8 and, and, eight and 12,000. So according to the CEFIC study that uh, was run last year by Ricardo. So extrapolating shows the need really to, to be focused on what to communicate, how to communicate, and uh, how far, how much detail to communicate. But all in all, it clearly shows that this overall approach is a really huge effort for industry. And we take it seriously. We want to have it. We want to contribute really to, to the uh, more sustainable market. Uh, but we seeing these efforts, we need time. We need time, we need a roadmap, we have to be uh, co-architects really to create this, this future, to make it really happen and uh, to make it a success. Yeah, and I, I would like to add to that if I may, Erica, thanks. So, um, uh, different estimates on the numbers of substances of concern on the market, but I, I think uh, order of magnitude, that's a, a good, uh, I completely agree with your point. It, it speaks to another order of magnitude and, and, and quite, some, quite some work to be done. I would like to highlight that the ESPR does foresee a phased implementation of DPP going first with their priority sectors. So let's see how that evolves, but I imagine we'll have quite some learnings from the first implementations. Uh, and I, I totally agree, we need to, we need to get the, the next step in terms of clarity and, and system and so on. Yeah. Erica and Kevin, thank you very much for all the insights in the Sustainable Product Initiative. Uh, something we can ponder on if we are queuing for another security screening while traveling. As expected, you have passed the interview screening test, so safe travels home. Thank you.